Um, today I want to talk about unity and continue on. Uh, and did you notice that when we were worshiping and the one song about fire come down and all of a sudden there was something, there was a deeper move and we call it, there's just an anointing that fell upon the place. God's Holy Spirit just seemed to be pouring out. And there was a unity of, of voices that came together, a unity of heart, a unity of spirit. Something happened in our worship time that we, the body, came together in unity. Now, if you're sitting there and you say, I don't know what the heck you're talking about, you're, you're missing it, you know? Because if you've got the spirit of God in you, then, then when your spirit starts worshiping the Lord and the body comes together in unity, something happens. There's a fire that starts burning, if you will. And, uh, and you all contribute to that. If, if we, tonight we're going to have a bonfire, but if there is only two sticks in it, that'd be a campfire, not a bonfire, would it? But, but a bonfire is when we all come in and we put a piece of wood on that and all of a sudden, you know, it's huge. It's like a barn. It's big. And that's what you do when you come in here to worship and you, you're just going after God. If it's just the worship team, it's just going to be a little campfire, you know, a little, you know, nothing. I shouldn't say nothing, but, but, you know, we all contribute. And then when we come together in unity, I believe that's something God does in his spirit. And he starts working in each and every one of you in your heart that the Holy Spirit all of a sudden can, can start doing a work in your heart and in your soul and in your spirit. God is alive and well, and he's doing just an awesome, awesome work. Harold and I would just like to thank all of you that uh, we had a little pastor's appreciation. Thank you for the cards and letters and the gifts. Just we, we love our church, and we thank you for this family. You know, this family has us together for right now, for a reason, for a season of life, together. And uh, we're together to join in unity in his spirit to do what he desires to do. So what do you think is a first priority then and practically that you need to walk out in your Christian walk? Where does the rubber meet the road in the first thing that as a follower of Jesus that you should be concerned with? And are you doing this? If you turn to Ephesians 1, we're going to continue on talking about unity. In, in verse 1, of, we'll see where Paul starts off. And I'm using the ESV version. It's a different translation than NIV, but it'll be close enough. It says, therefore, now this starts off with as a prisoner for the Lord, then, but my translation starts off with therefore, which is kind of then, a prisoner of the Lord, I urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called. It starts off with therefore because Paul had been giving in the first chapters uh, what therefore is therefore. He lined out all these kind of principles. Therefore, he says, as a prisoner for the Lord, I urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you've been called. Beloved, he's saying, lead a life worthy of your calling. Lead a life worthy of your calling. Well, what is your calling? I don't know. <laughs> you should know what your calling is. If he isn't, then you, you need to dig into that. We need to pray together. You need to seek what your calling is because I believe every Christian has a call upon their life. Paul says earlier in the book of Ephesians, as he goes through, he, he kind of lays what therefore is therefore. He says, he, he lays a doctrinal standard, if you will, for the church. He talks about in chapter 1 about being chosen by the Father, that you and I that were chosen by the Father, were redeemed by the Son, were sealed by the Holy Spirit. Paul talks about salvation by grace in chapter 2 and talks about a little bit in chapter 2 what we were in the past and then what we were or what we are in the present and then what we shall be in the future. He lays a foundation for us about the oneness of Jews and Gentiles in Christ. He talks about the Gentiles, what they were without Christ, 
but now we're one body, he gives us an illustration, and we're one building. We're, and then he gives a revelation of the mystery of the church today, the mystery of the ages, the mystery that God has passed down to us. He talks about the grace of God and the fellowship we have with God. And then he goes into the believer's conduct. And that's what we're looking at today. What is the practically the conduct in which we're to walk in and what we're, we're, we're to walk and be worthy of? It says, therefore, a prisoner for the Lord. If you think about the prisoner for the Lord, if you think about I haven't been there, but, you know, when, you, when you're in prison, you know, structure's all done for you. You know, you, they, they have, they, every, their time there is all structured out. It's all planned out. They, they live by someone else's schedule. They live by a, a, someone else's agenda. You know, interesting enough, there's, there's laws within the jail or the prison that they do. And I was watching a special, and they say, and then the prisoners himself have law that they go by. So they live by two different laws. It's interesting, isn't it? And if their prisoner's out of step with one of the laws, then they're going to pay for it. Either they're going to pay for it by other prisoners according to their law or by the prison guards according to the laws of the prison. Isn't it interesting that we as Christians have a law also that God has given to us? A structure in which we live in, a structure in which we go by. And in that structure, it brings unity, it brings togetherness. Therefore, a prisoner for the Lord urge you to walk in a manner worthy of your calling to which you've been called. And then verse 2 says, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. We're called to walk in these ways, and it's not about our Christian life standing still. And in fact, I believe that if you're a Christian and you feel like you're standing still, you're really backsliding because you're not going forward in the things of God. Some of you are wearing out your tennis shoes. You're backsliding so fast. It's like the rubber is, is streaking down the road because you're just backsliding in your Christian walk. God has called us to... At be active in our faith to activate our faith. We're to step into the things of God, be intentional, to move in a, in a particular direction, in a particular way. Well, what is that way? The standard or the law that God lays out for us as a prisoner of Christ. There should be personal growth that takes place and a persistent growth that takes place and a day-by-day -day growth that takes place in our lives if we're truly walking. Every day should be a day you walk up, wake up, and, and your day should be started with, how can I do the things of the Lord today? What can I learn in the things of the Lord? How can I walk in a way worthy of my calling today, Lord? Because today is a day that he's created, and I will rejoice and be glad in it, and I'm going to live today for my Lord and my Savior, not for myself. And that's hard. Do I do it every day? But that's my goal. That's my vision. Maybe not. Maybe there's days that I get up on the wrong side of the bed like you do, and I start living for myself. And usually those days don't end all that well. <laughs> or I come into worship practice, and Steve got the, the sound all cranked up, and boy, that puts me right into the flesh right away. And I go, okay, am I going to walk in the spirit or walk in the flesh? I got challenged all the time. Steve's a challenge to me but I love my brother. I love him. It teaches me when we have these, it teaches me with all humility and gentleness, with patience. I couldn't believe I were preaching this this morning because I had to walk it out this morning to be humility and, and gentle and patience and bearing in love with one another when I don't want to do that. That's not my natural thing.
And then Paul in the unity, and he's talking about unity. Then he, he kind of goes on and he gives, he gives an order. I want us to, to read it together because it's important to know that as a body of Christ, we're not perfect. And when we talk about unity, the church is actually so disunified. It's so difficult. Even, even you know, the denominations that are even within the Baptists, you've got, you know, 50 different Baptist churches. They can't unify even within the name Baptist. You know, we just, we're so disunified. It, it's just a wonder God puts up with us, you know. And, and it's so hard for us. We have so many disagreements. But here Paul is saying, and, and for us today, let, let us catch this, that, that the desire that, that, that as Paul wrote this letter, it's still the desire for us as a church today. There is disunity in the beginning of the church, and that's why he had to write this. That's how he write to the, to the church in the very beginnings is because there needed to be structure and order and there was a lot of things that were going on then. And today there's a lot of things going on today to, to cause disunity. And so verse four, he, he says, there is one body and, and one spirit, just as you were called to, to one hope, you were called, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father who is, who is over all and through all and in all. But to each one of us, grace has been given as Christ apportioned it. And this is why it says, when he ascended on high, he led his captives in his train and gave gifts to men. I want to stop right there. To each one of us, he gives a measure of grace, some of the translations. You know, there's times I need a lot of measure of grace in my life, you know, and there's a lot of times that you need grace to put up with me in your lives because we're all, we're all need grace to be able to put up with, with some of the things that we have to put up in life with our children, with our friends, with our relatives. God gives us the grace. And as he ascended up into heaven, he led the captives free that were that were there wasn't any freedom before that time and then he said he gave gifts to men well what are those gifts i believe that he set up a structure for the church and down a few verses in verse 11 and it said it was he who gave some that means some of you and i to be apostles and here comes a it's called the fivefold ministry it's a structure a leadership structure he gave some to be apostles he gave some to be prophets he gave some to be evangelists, and he gave some to be pastors and teachers. For what? To prepare God's people for the works of service so that the body of Christ, the church, you and I, may be built up until we reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God. And we become mature. Become mature attaining the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Now, when it says measure there, then a measure is a, you know, if you think of a ruler and you, you measure how long this is and how long that in, or, or a measuring cup, you put this much in, and, you know, do you want, you want just a cup, you want a pint, you want a gallon? What is the measure that you want God to pour into your life? I don't know about you, but I'm saying pour it all in, God. I, fill me to overflowing and give me a bigger cup to fill because I want more of God in my life. I want him to use me. I want more of his giftings. I want more of his, his anointing on my life. Why? Because when we get the fullness of Christ, we become mature. And then it keeps us from the next verse. In verse 14, it says, Then we, we no longer be infants, tossed back and forth by the waves. Well, what does that waves mean? It means the struggles of life. It means the things that come against you. It means decisions that you make. It means the temptations that you have and the sin that's before you that you just don't get blown back and forth. If you're getting blown back and forth, and you're so busy, if you think of a buoy out in the ocean and the ocean waves are coming, and if it's not anchored in, in Christ and have a solid anchor in the bottom, which is Christ, then it just gets blown and tossed all around and carried by the currents. 
And then we never become effective for God. We never find the calling of God in our lives because we're so busy blown about. We never get into the mature things that God wants us to live in and walk in and do. We get, we get so caught up in other things that are really meaningless things. Why? It's because they're not kingdom things. And God has called you to do a kingdom work. But if you're so busy being tossed around in immaturity, being blown back and forth by the things of this life, then I believe that you, you never really get solid in the calling that God has called you in. It says here that every wind, and it goes about teaching and the cunning and craftiness of men and their deceitful scheming. You know, it just, today, it's just, it's, there's such a, a hearsay philosophy and a, and if you and I there's no absolute truth today and it's taught in our schools and and our young people are grown up into it. and so they say well if you and I agree on this and it's okay if we do this and and you say no it's not okay and it's like it's it's just dumbfounding me the, the decisions that people make today because they don't they're not raised with absolute truth and the Bible gives us a guideline it gives us absolute truth in which we can stand on nothing else in the world does But if we don't believe that the Bible is absolute truth, then we're just going to be thrown around by the waves. It says here in 15, but instead, speaking the truth in love, and I love you, and that's why I'm trying to speak the truth today. We will in all things grow up, mature in him who is the head, and that is Christ. From him the whole body joined in and held together by every supporting ligament grows and builds itself up in love as each do their part. You see, when the, the body works together and, and we're functioning in the gifts that God has, it, it's not a struggle to do the things that God has called us to do. And it's not a burnout to do those things. It's not the church taking advantage. I heard sometimes, well, are, are you doing that? Well, the church is just taking advantage of you. I thought, my goodness, what a lie. That, that person just doesn't understand. Our, our job really as a church is, is to help you find your giftings and then, and then as a church and the leaders of the church, help you fulfill your destiny in God. And some people say, oh, they're just being used by the church. The Bible says that the world doesn't understand, does it? So it's really ignorance that is speaking that. You know what? Sometimes I hear Christians ignorant speaking those words in our church. Shame on you. And why? Usually it's because you burnt out and you just missed what you, you, you missed your calling. You don't want to be told what to do or, or you feel whatever it is that how you got hurt. Disunity erupts in your life. And today we face, it's just so desperately broken. Families are broken. Our nation is broken. We have disunity within the nations, disunity in our government. Even our local government is in disunity and dysfunction. It's, not fa it's in families, it's in marriages it's all around. What the church can stand as a beacon in this and we can have a wholeness and a unity that people could see that there's a difference in the church. We have unity in our families, unity in our home, unity as a church. There's something different. Why? It's because we have God. We have a standard. We have a Bible that we live by. God, what God did in salvation is not just bring some people to heaven, but it was restore what was lost. It was to restore the unity everything would be reconciled and return, as a, they say in Jerusalem, to shalom, peace, unity. And I believe that peace and unity, shalom, manifests itself in the salvation of our Lord. The good news is that there will be a day that when God will make all things new, there will be a day that there will no longer be disunity. There will be a day, the Bible says, that there will be no more wars, no more disease, no more disorder. 
There will be a place that God designed and wanted from the day of creation that man interrupted God's whole plan. Ephesians 9 and 10 talks about the mystery of his will according to his purpose, which is set forth in Christ. He had a plan in verse 10. It says, has a plan for the fullness of time. And what is that plan, a fullness of time in verse 10? It says to unite all things in him. That's God's plan. It's to unite all things in him. All things in heaven and all things on earth. In Christ, everything becomes reunited. No longer separation between Jews and Gentiles. No longer separation between the young and old, the rich and poor, the male and female. There's something that takes place. So in Christ, which is the body and the bride of Christ, we, the church, are to walk in a manner worthy of our call. And we should be eager to maintain the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. Unity and peace comes together. When you're in unity, there's harmony. And when there's harmony, there's contentment. And when there's contentment, there's just a peace that satisfies that the world cannot satisfy. In fact, the Bible says that this peace the world cannot understand. Why? It's because it's God that comes into our life. And when there's unity in our life and there's order in our life, that brings a peace in our life, that brings a contentment in our life. It's not about money. It's not about things. It's not about materials. It's about God's working in our life. Coming together in unity brings us a, a rock-solid faith in which we, we put our doctrines in. Basic truths of the scriptures that we stand on. And there's a unity of the spirit. Notice as Paul writes in that, it's usually a capital S because it's talking about the Holy Spirit. So if we understand unity, we also must realize that the Holy Spirit that comes here and brings all truth, brings us into a, a deeper unity. And we're to be eager to, uh, to maintain the unity of the Spirit. The Spirit takes up residence within us. So he also brings a spirit of unity within us. And biblical unity is from the inside out. See, the, the trouble with the world and the trouble with carnality and, and those who are not, they just don't get it in their Christian walk. They, they're always trying to look for, for satisfaction outside. But biblical unity works from the inside out. It's a work that the Holy Spirit is doing in our hearts and in our minds and in our spirit that renews us and refreshes us and brings unity. The Holy Spirit in you and the Holy Spirit in me meet together and there's unity. That's why we can, we can meet somebody and we maybe met them for the first time and, and you, could just, you just know that they're a Christian and you start talking about God and there's an automatic unity that, that brings you close as family. I remember going back home and discussing things with my sisters. I have two sisters that are still alive and, and we try to talk about a subject and it's like World War III breaks up. I, there's, we can't agree because we come from two different factions. We have two different mindsets. One is so much of the world. And, and I try to bring the, the spirit and my beliefs in God. And they look to me as like I'm the chauvinist, you know, whatever I am. You know, I can't say sometimes what they call me. But, uh, but they, just, they just don't get it, you know. And they don't see that where we come from and we live in our lives is that we're trying to live out of the, the spirit. And so we see things in so much a different way. And so we judge things in such a different way. And, and uh, when we talk about marriage and, and things like that, it's just in a whole such a different light. And so there's a disunity. But when the family of God comes together and we, we agree and we have the Holy Spirit in our lives, they're just, there's just a, we're part of the forever family. And all of a sudden, our ties are closer than our earth family because we're part of the forever family. And I talked about that last week. 
2 Corinthians 13, 14, Paul gives us just a further example as he wrote to Corinthians. Who was struggling? He's in verse 14. He says, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you. Be with you. The fellowship of the Holy Spirit. We're to eagerly seek that in, in our lives. What does the word eager mean? It means to do something with intense effort or motivation. You've got to work hard at it. It's to do one's best to, to go after it, to work at it. It just doesn't come naturally. And to maintain, maintain unity. It means to, to, to work at it at a continuational state. It's an intense effort and motivation to continue in the state of the unity of the Spirit. So we're walking in the manner worthy of our calling. Our job, our assignment, our goal as a Christian is with all humility, in verse 2, and gentleness, with peace, bearing with one another in love, to walk in unity. You know, Moses was a great leader in his day. And he, God called him to a certain assignment. And Moses didn't want to do that, did he? Moses said, use my brother Aaron because he's more eloquent. I, I stutter and I can't get the right words on it. I don't get the right thoughts. And hey, I can relate to Moses sometimes, you know. I make up words. <laughs> Some may have a notebook with all the words I've made up. But here, Moses, that was a man that God chosen, not because of what he was, but because God chose him for a calling to be able to lead a people. And God knew more of his heart and his life that it would affect millions of people. In fact, it not only, it is still affecting millions of people because even the Jews today look at him as the father of the Jews. He was meek but he was not weak. Meekness is a power and strength that's under control. Think of this, a word can be associated with a horse with all its strength and power, but it's under control by, by just a little thing in its mouth that the master has to control him. Or a rudder of a great ship is just a small thing, but it controls this huge ship. So as a Christian then, we don't have to show our, our power and strength all the time. If it's under control, there's a meekness that comes. Christ demonstrated weakness, being God in the flesh. He gets up from the table as God and starts washing the disciples' feet. As God walks on the road to Calvary as God allows himself to be beaten and whipped, whipped and, and tortured in meekness. It wasn't because he was weak. He understood his calling, that he would become something for you and I, that, that in his strength he had to become a sacrifice for you and I. So he took on what the world had to give him. He took on what you and I had to give him because we had to give him our sin also. Meekness is not weakness. When Jesus faced the devil after he fasted for 40 days and was probably on a spiritual high, I talked with the Iwanas guys, the, my, the class in Iwanas last week. Jesus was meek, but he wasn't weak. Even after he fasted 40 days and the devil tried to throw him off and tempt him, he was able to stay, no. Satan, you're not going to throw me off. In a sense, he was saying, I know the word of God. I know my assignment, and I'm sticking to it. Jesus taught about being blessed are the poor in spirit. They will find the kingdom of heaven. Matthew 11, 29 and 30 says this, Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest in your, for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. So here's the inner attitude that God wants us to take. He says, 
take your burdens and, and the yoke that it shows that there was always two oxen that went and usually there was a lead auction that was bigger and they usually had a, a you know junior auction that was that was smaller that would walk along the bigger one and would follow his steps and they would be yoked together and and christ is the is the older um oxen if you will willing to plow the and where to take that yoke and follow behind him and he says that that i will take your burdens follow me Seek ye first the kingdom of God and my righteousness, and then everything else will be added unto you. My yoke is easy, God is saying to you. My burden is light. Church, cast your burdens. Cast your cares. Cast your issues upon Christ. And then as we walk and realize our position, then it's so much easier as we gain maturity. When we gain maturity, we're, we're able to handle other people's faults. You know, it's the immature that blows up, isn't it? It's the immature that starts yelling and screaming and wants to fight all the time. As we mature in, in the Lord, we're able to handle more of the Christians that need to be brought up a little bit, isn't it? So we don't need to get offended. We don't need to get upset. We need to be patient and kind and long-bearing, long-suffering for those who may not be at the maturity level that we're at. That brings unity. That brings unity. And it's hard. And where do you draw that line? I don't know. I pray about that a lot of times with people. Where do you draw the line to saying that, uh, I just, you know, I can't, you know, I can't bear it anymore with him. And, and I think God has to show you that. 2 Timothy 2, 23 and 26 says, has nothing, do not, have nothing to do with foolish and arrogant controversies. You know that they breed quarrels. And the Lord's servants must not be quarrelsome, but kind to one another, able to teach patiently and enduring evil, correcting his opponents with gentleness. God may perhaps grant them repentance leading to the knowledge of the truth. And they may come to their senses and escape from the snare of the devil after being captured by him to do his will. And so we're, we're kind of in the saving business even with one another to be patient and kind. And I always say this, but I don't get tired because the truth, the church likes to shoot the wounded. We see someone that aren't living to the level that we're living, living, and so we tend to want to just shoot them and beat them up and cast them out without, without trying to, 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 to bring them up, to restore them into a place that they should be. And it just seems as the more dark the world goes and the more the United States even goes in a thing, the, the more we're faced in the church like never before, the, the sin of the church, the sins of the Christian the sins in the way that, that you're living and you keep coming to church, but you keep doing the things that you're doing and, and it's kind of like, my God, when will they get it? How long do I have to, you know, there's times I'd like to just take a two by four and hit some of you, you know, because you, you don't give up the world's way and God is saying, I want to give you peace and unity. And so it's difficult at times, isn't it, to be gentle. And to try to restore somebody and, and that in that gentleness would, would, would help them to lead them into a time of repentance of their sin and in their life. Bearing with one another in love. You know, the Bible says that the truth never changes. The truth doesn't change, and, and, and we walk in a way, and, and in fact, in Corinthians, it's talking about love and walking in love, and, you know, we see in a mirror dimly, and, and, and that means that even in biblical truth, and maybe this is why we have so much denomination and so much disunity, is because we, I don't think any of it, no one gets totally what God's trying be, to, to teach us and to lead us into, because we see in a mirror dimly. It's like looking in a shower and it's all fogged up and we're, we're trying to see ourselves. You know, we're, we're, you know, we can't quite see ourselves. There's so much truth that God wants to convey. In fact, Jesus said to his disciples, he said, there's so much I want to teach you, but you're not, re you're not ready to get it. 
and I, I'm going to leave you the Holy Spirit, and, and he'll lead you into deeper truths. In a sense, what that's saying is really the Bible and what we have is elementary teachings. In Hebrews, it says, you know, don't argue over the elementary teachings. And that's exactly what we do, the elementary teachings of the Bible. We've been spending Wednesday nights looking at those elementary areas. John 17, 11, and this is the last scripture. It says that, and he, it's Jesus' prayer. And I, I, I read it last week, but. When we talk about unity, wow. He says, I'm no longer in the world. So Jesus is saying, I'm no longer in the world. But he says, but they, and that's you, you are in the world. He goes, and I'm coming to you, Holy Father. He says, keep them in your name, which you have given me, that they may be one, even as we are one. Could you be so intimate with your father, with your papa, with your daddy that you want to live a life that's worthy of the calling that he has upon your life and not live for yourself, not live for materials, not live for all the, those things that says, seek ye first the kingdom of God and everything else will be added unto you. I, I, I claim that promise over my life. And you know what? God did that. God has blessed us beyond what we ever imagined, what we ever thought and and. There was times that we didn't know if we were going to get bread or, or, or milk at the store. But we were living the call. We were committed. Will you be that way? Would you all please stand and bow your heads? Hi, I'm Pastor John McConnell, and I'd like to welcome you today for watching our program. It's just amazing the technology we have today that we're able to live stream all around the world. And we'd like to give you an opportunity, if you'd like to give towards this ministry, you can go online and be able to uh, follow the directions that are on there and be able to give to the ministry that you've been watching. So God bless you. We thank you for being part of Southside Alliance Church today.